not the case. In some cases, uh, there would actually be algorithms and very sophisticated algorithms. So in Mengwetu sculpture, you see this recursive geometry. In uh, Ethiopian crosses, you see this wonderful unfolding of the shape. Um, in uh, Angola, the uh, Chokwe people draw lines in the sand, and it's what German mathematician Euler called a, a, a graph. We now call it an Eulerian path. You can never lift your stylus from the surface, and you can never go over the same line twice. But they do it recursively, and they do it with an age grade system. So the little kids learn this one, and then the older kids learn this one, and then the next age grade initiation, you learn this one. And with, with each iteration of that algorithm, you learn the, the, the iterations of the myth. You, you learn the next level of knowledge. And finally, all over Africa, you see this board game. Uh, it's called Awari in Ghana, where I studied it. It's called uh, Mankala here on the East Coast, Bao in uh, Kenya, Sogo elsewhere. Uh, well, you see self-organizing patterns that spontaneously occur in this board game. And the, the folks in, in Ghana knew about these self-organizing patterns and would use them strategically. So this is very conscious knowledge. Here's a, a wonderful fractal. Uh, anywhere you go in the Sahel, you'll see this, this, uh, this windscreen. And of course, fences around the world are all Cartesian, all strictly linear. But here in Africa, you've got these nonlinear scaling fences. So I, I tracked down one of the folks who makes these things, this guy in, in uh, Mali just outside of Bamako, and I asked him, how come you're making fractal fences? Because nobody else is. And his answer was very interesting. He said, well, if I lived in the jungle, I would only use the long rows of straw because they're very quick and they're very cheap. Doesn't take much time, doesn't take much straw. He said, but wind and dust goes through pretty easily. Now, the tight rows up at the very top, they really hold out the wind and dust but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of straw because they're really, really tight. Now, he said, we know from experience that the farther up from the ground you go, the stronger the wind blows, right? It's just like a cost-benefit analysis. And I measured out the lengths of straw, put it on a log-log plot, got the scaling exponent, and it almost exactly matches the scaling exponent for the relationship between wind speed and height in the wind engineering handbook. So th these guys are right on target for, for a practical use of, of uh, scaling technology. The most complex example of uh, an algorithmic approach to fractals that I found was actually not in geometry, it was in a symbolic code. And this was uh, Bamana sand divination. And the same divination system is found all over Africa. Um, you can find on the East Coast as, as, well, as well as the, the West Coast. And often the, the, the symbols are, are very well preserved. So, so uh, each of these symbols has uh, four bits, it's a four bit binary word. You draw these lines in the sand randomly uh, and then you count off, and if it's an odd number, you put down one stroke, and if it's an even number, you put down two stroke. And they did this uh, very rapidly, and I couldn't understand where they were getting, they only did the randomness four times. I couldn't understand where they were getting the other 12 symbols. Uh, and they wouldn't tell me. They said, no, 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 I can't, I can't tell you about this. I said, well, look, I'll, I'll pay you. You, know, you can be my teacher, and, and, and I'll come each day and pay you. I said, oh, it's not a matter of money. You know, this is a religious matter. And finally, out of desperation, I said, well, let me explain George Cantor in 1877. And I started explaining you know, why I was there in, in Africa. And they got very excited when they saw the Cantor set. And uh, one of them said, you know, come here, I, I think I can help you out here. And so he took me through the initiation ritual for, for a, a Bamana a priest. Um, and of course, I was only interested in the math, so the whole time he kept shaking his head going, you know, I didn't learn it this way. But I, I had to sleep with uh, a kola nut next to my bed, buried in sand, and give seven coins to seven lepers, and, and so on. Um, and finally, he, he, he revealed the, uh, the truth of the matter. Uh, and it turns out it's a pseudo-random number generator. They're using deterministic chaos. When you have a, a four-bit symbol, you then put it together with another one sideways. So, even plus odd gives you odd. Odd plus even gives you odd. Even plus even gives you even. Odd plus odd gives you even. So it's addition modulo two, just like in the parity bit check on your computer. Uh, and then you, you take this symbol and you put it back in, so it's a self-generating diversity of symbols. They're, they're truly using a, a kind of deterministic chaos in doing this. Now, because it's a, a, a binary code, you can actually implement this in hardware. What a fantastic teaching tool that should be uh, in, in African engineering schools. And the, the most interesting thing I found out about it was uh, historical. In the 12th century, Hugo of Santalia brought it from Islamic mystics into Spain. Uh, and there it entered into uh, the, 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 uh, the alchemy community as geomancy, the, 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 the divination through the earth. This is a geomantic chart drawn by uh, uh, for, the, for King Richard II in 1390. Leibniz, the German mathematician, talked about geomancy in his dissertation called De Decombinatoria. 
And he said, well, instead of using one stroke and two strokes, let's use a one and a zero. And we can count by powers of two, right? Ones and zeros, the binary code. George Boole took Leibniz's binary code and created Boolean algebra, and John von Neumann took Boolean algebra and created the digital computer. So all these, these little PDAs and, and laptops, every digital circuit in the world started in Africa. And I, I, I know uh, Brian Eno says there's, there's not enough African in computers, but you know, I don't think there's enough African history in Brian Eno. <laughs> so let me end with just a few words about um, applications that we've, we've found for this. And you can go to our website. The applets are, are all free. They just run in the browser. Uh, anybody in the world can use them. The uh, National Science Foundation's uh, Broadening Participation in Computing program recently awarded us a grant to make um, a, 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 a programmable version of these design tools. So, so uh, hopefully in three years, anybody will be able to go on the web and create their own simulations of their own artifacts. But we focused in the US on, on uh, African American students as well as Native American and Latino. Uh, and we found statistically significant improvement with children using this uh, software in the mathematics class in comparison with, with a control group that did not have the software. Uh, so it's really very successful uh, teaching children that they have a heritage that's about mathematics, that it's not just about singing and dancing. Uh, we've started a pilot program in uh, Ghana. We got a, a, a small uh, seed grant just to, to uh, see if folks would be willing to work with us on this. And we're very excited about the future possibilities for that. We've also been working in uh, design. I didn't put his, his name up here. My colleague, uh, Kerry in, in Kenya, has come up with this great idea for using a fractal structure for postal address in villages that have fractal structures. Because if you try to impose a, a grid structure postal system on a fractal village, it, it, it doesn't quite fit. Bernard Chumi at Columbia University has been interested in using this in a design for a uh, museum of African art. David Hughes at uh, Ohio State University uh, has written a, a primer on uh, Afrocentric architecture in which he's, he's used some of these fractal structures. And finally, I just wanted to point out that this idea of self-organization, as we heard earlier, you know, it's, it's in the brain. Um, it's, in the, 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 uh, it's in Google search engine. Actually, the reason Google was such a success is because they were the first ones to take advantage of the self-organizing properties of the web. Uh, it's in ecological sustainability. It's in the developmental power of entrepreneurship, the ethical power of democracy. Um, it's, it's also in some bad things. Self-organization is why the AIDS virus is spreading so fast. And if you don't think that capitalism, which is self-organizing, can have destructive effects, you, you haven't opened your eyes enough. So we need to think about, uh, as, as, as was spoken earlier, the traditional African methods for doing self-organization. These are robust algorithms. These are ways of doing self-organization, of doing entrepreneurship uh, that are gentle, that are egalitarian. Um, so if we want to find uh, a better way of doing that kind of work, uh, we need look only no farther than Africa to find these robust self-organizing algorithms. Thank you. It's a sports car, yet a sedan. yet fuel efficient, modern, yet timeless. Introducing the new BMW 3 Series, our most advanced three, yet.